Greetings, you're on the Bible Forum. I am Warren Sprouse. Be glad to be back with you. We're looking at government tonight. Is government peeking into your spending habits? Hmm. It is just possible. In the name of fighting terrorism and the financing of terrorism, a new U.S. Senate bill threatens to force private corporations to monitor your financial activity and empowers government to seize all of your assets if you fail to comply with this new law. Even failure to fill out one form is license for the federal government to take everything you have. The bill has four sponsors, Senator Chuck Grassley, a Republican from Iowa, Diane Feinstein, a Democrat from California, John Cornyn, Republican from Texas, Sheldon Whitehouse, a Democrat from Rhode Island. The bill is called Senate Bill 1241, Combating Money Laundering, Terrorist Financing, and Counterfeiting Act of 2017. It was introduced in May of this year, just a couple of months ago, actually just last month, and represents what some financial experts say is a new assault on cash and digital currencies. The purpose is to fight criminal and terrorist money laundering efforts. However, apparently, the banking institutions will be given orders to look for evidence and they themselves will become the primary architects of the schemes that make their activity profitable and this clearly on a massive scale. Peter Reagan, a financial market strategist at Birch Gold Group, says if the bill becomes law, Americans would be subject to a whole host of government intrusions. For example, failing to complete a single report reporting form would result in the government being granted abilities to freeze and seize not just a portion but the entirety of your assets. The bill even goes far as to include the contents of a safety deposit box. It makes any business with government ties to act as a de facto arm of the Department of Homeland Security. As the bill stands today, precious metal holdings are not covered under the required declarations, at least not yet. Most other monetary instruments, however, would be locked down tight. Cash, Bitcoin, and something called cryptocurrencies. It's the war on cash, and it's been underway for some time. The difference is that this bill, Reagan says, would solidify a serious loss of freedom we've been fearing for years. For example, if you deal in drugs and you get caught, the government seizes everything you have, wherever you have it, and they do that first. Then you go to court. And a not guilty verdict does not guarantee the return of your assets. After the not guilty verdict, you would have to fight to get your assets back. It curtails our right to travel with more than $10,000 in cash unless you file a report with the U.S. government. Now, for years, we couldn't deposit more than $10,000 without a separate form. It also gives the government and supposedly the businesses involved authority to engage in surveillance and wiretapping, including your phone, your email, and your texts. Just a hint of suspicion triggers the law, according to Simon Black of SovereignMan.com. Can you see the sign now? That sign, six, six, six. You see it? Our rights, our freedoms, and our finances are slowly being eroded and limited. One day, 
the systems will be in place to simply control all expenditures, then what? Now, you need to note that the government and many businesses you deal with already know all they need in order to shut you down. If they wanted to, and the law allowed them, in our society today, society today there are no more secrets. Technology has removed anonymity and secrets. You want to go off the grid? Can't do it. I mean, you can do it. Don't change anything. You got to stay off the grid to start with. And that's tough. You guys remember Ben Kinchlaw? Ben Kinchlaw is a minister, a broadcaster, an author, a businessman. Uh, he was longtime co host of the 700 Club on CBN host of the international edition of the show that's seen in more than 80 countries. He's also the founder of Americans for Israel and also the African American Political Awareness Coalition. Ben is writing. He writes about our founding fathers and he says they understood the weaknesses inherent in the nature of man. They knew the history of the rise and fall of former great nations. They were willing to pay the price to safeguard all that had been accomplished by all who had gone before, by fighting for a system of governance that would be founded upon key concepts, a self-governed citizenry, a limited government, sovereignty of the people, adherence to agreed upon law, and a national commitment to the basic principles required to live in a free society, too numerous to list here. And all of this was to be respected and defended in the foundational documents of this radical new society. The Founding Fathers wrote the Declaration of Independence, established the Constitution, and amended it with the Bill of Rights, all to ensure that this society of sovereign individuals, designed by God to be free and self-directed, would never again live under the heel of master or tyrant. They clearly understood that our rights did not come from a constitution or a government. Rights come expressly from the creator of the universe alone. We then become stewards of these rights. While we have broken free from dictatorships and oppression, we have drifted away from the understanding of the origin and foundation of our freedoms and the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that we claim. And he says, as I was watching the news coverage recently of a series of demonstrations by college students, one primarily by blacks, another by a homosexual group, and still another by a mixed group of political agitators, I was troubled to see how tragically unaware we have become of the reason for the lawlessness of our nation. We are willfully abandoning all of the aforementioned principles and concepts that once made America a light unto the world. And he suggests that we cannot survive. That we will not survive. If we are not self-governed, if our government becomes bloated and oppressive, if we do not understand and cherish the awesome privilege and responsibility that comes with being a sovereign citizen, or if any of us starts defying the rule of law and living as a law unto ourselves, casting off the contract we made with our fellow citizens, and finally willingly abandoning belief in God and His best for us as beings, made in his image. 
Kitch Law says this is not a game. This is our survival. This is our nation's survival. We have come so far and we have been so blessed by our Creator with the abundance and approbation, meaning praise and commendation. We must once again commit to those founding principles that made America the great nation it has become. I would add that this is virtually impossible to accomplish. And I don't say that because it can't be done. I say it because I understand the three generations of Americans who have been taught everything contrary to that. So contrary that just reading what he has to say for many people is foreign. They don't get it. They don't believe what they do get. And that's why they're out in the streets. That's why they're sitting home watching television. That's why they don't participate in anything but fun and games. And they live in their mom's basement until they're 35. That's what's going on. That's why in our society we actually accept the idea that the federal government is supposed to provide health coverage. My parents, my grandparents, and yours would turn over in their grave. What are you, out of your mind? A government providing health care? It's ridiculous. That is a personal responsibility. But the vast majority of Americans not only accept that concept, they see it as a right. And they will fight you tooth and nail. If I were President of the United States and had the authority, I would abandon the whole thing and turn it all back to the insurance companies. They'd run me out of town on a rail if I lived long enough. But that's the way we lived until the progressives got control of two generations of people. No, I do not think we will ever go back. We can only move forward. And forward is not going to be fun. You remember Bernie Sanders? He's a senator from Vermont. Ran for president of the United States. You might have heard of him. Well, Bernie Sanders has no problem with the Christian faith of President Donald Trump's pick for Deputy White House Budget Director. A man by the name of Russell Voigt, Voigt, V-O-U-G-H-T. But Senator Bernie says the nominee is not welcome to serve in the government. Bernie Sanders is my age. No excuse. Why? He says the nominee, this Russell Vogt or Vault or whatever, is a Christian. And more than that, he's a Christian who last year, 2016, wrote in a blog post that Islam is a, quote, deficient theology. He went on to argue that Muslims, quote, stand condemned, end of quote, because they have rejected faith in Jesus Christ. Sanders didn't like that, doesn't like that. Is Bernie Sanders a Muslim? No. Is Bernie Sanders a Christian? No. He's an atheist. His declared opposition to this man's nomination and ultimately Everything about him revolves around his religious values. And he says his religious values now disqualify him from public office. You have to be either an atheist, a secularist, or a Christian that really doesn't believe anything that Christianity stands for. You can be an atheist and deny everything this country stands for. But you can't be a Christian and support everything this country was founded upon. Does that make sense to you? 
He appeared uh, last week, I guess it was, on CNN's State of the Union. And host Jake Tapper asked the lawmaker if someone is, quote, necessarily hateful or Islamophobic, end of quote, if they believe the only path to God is through Jesus Christ. And Sanders said, no, absolutely not. Look what our Constitution, one of the great parts of our Constitution, says. It is there to protect freedom of religion. You practice what religion you want. I do, Bernie says. Mr. Vote does, and that's about all there is. But what about freedom in Sanders' mind? In his mind, freedom doesn't mean it's okay for Vote to hold a job in federal government. In fact, he said it would be unacceptable for the Christian nominee to do so. Why? Because he actually believes what he believes to the extent that he would apply it to others. And that my friends, we cannot have. Bernie Sanders' argument is, quote, at a time when we are dealing with Islamophobia in this country, when you got, <laughs> grammar stinks, when you got 1.2 billion people who are Muslims around the world, to have a high-ranking member of the United States government essentially say, oh, Islam is a second-class religion. Now, that seemed to me unacceptable as a government official, he said. In terms of his freedom of religion, he and every other American has the right to hold any point of view they want. Did any of you see the hearing, the Senate hearing, where all of this took place? When Senator Sanders was questioning this poor man and he was trying to defend what as best he could? Bernie Sanders' face was blood red. He was up in his seat. He was out of control. He was shouting at this candidate, this nominee, saying, you think your statement that you put into that publication, he was talking about the article in a publication called The Resurgent. It's a publication of Wheaton College, Volt's alma mater. It was there last year. That quote says, they do not know God because they rejected Jesus Christ, his son, and they stand condemned. Do you think that's respectful of other religions? Well, not necessarily, I would say. But I didn't say it to be disrespectful. I said it to tell the truth. The issue he was writing about at Wheaton College was the dismissal of a professor who claimed Christians and Muslims worship the same God. And clearly they do not. They're two different names, two different styles, two different laws, two different everything. This Trump nominee said a person cannot know the God of heaven, the God of the Bible, without complete faith in Jesus Christ. And he's telling the truth. So what do you think? I think vote is absolutely right. But is he allowed to say this in public? Is he allowed to say this as a public servant? And what does it say about him that, that he views every other religion inferior to Christianity? Well, the answer is he's on pretty solid biblical ground. And our founders would agree. But today it's not politically correct to say it out loud not in mixed company, meaning different religious groups. You can't tell people that because they don't believe what you believe, they're going to hell. Bernie doesn't believe a public servant can hold that position and be objective where the law is concerned. But think about it. No knowledgeable, practicing Muslim would say anything different if the tables were turned, unless he was trying to sneak into something good. What do they shout when they're about to murder you in cold blood? It's the Islamic equivalent of God is great, meaning yours is not, meaning I'm a follower of Allah, the only one true God of the universe. And I expect to go to paradise for no other reason than I'm about to cut your throat. 
Why? Because you are an unbeliever and you deserve to die. You won't convert. You have to die. Methinks the Christian position is much more gracious, much more generous. It says, my friend, you are dangerously mistaken and you need to reconsider. And then to consider my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who came and gave his life for you, asking nothing in return. But the Muslim would say, but I have Allah. But Allah is not the way, the truth, nor the light. Others in our society would say, well, I have my law. It could be Judaic law, Adventist law, Mormon law, Jehovah's Witnesses law, Charismatics law, or any other legalistic system of belief in the world. And I would say, but my friend, by the law, no man shall be saved. Doing good things doesn't get you anything. Makes you feel good and it benefits other people. But between you and your God, you're still lost. But I have my priest, my confessions, my bloodless sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ each and every Sunday. And I would say, but Jesus died once, never to be sacrificed again. And he is now our high priest seated in the heavenlies. I don't have a priest here on this earth running interference for me. Jesus is my priest running interference between me and God. My friends, religion is the great deception among men. No matter what it is, religion satisfies the flesh, the emotions, the intellect. But religion is not the way to heaven. Only as we repent of our core sin, our rejection of God and of Jesus and all that that stands for, and believe, the word means to commit your heart to God in Christ, trusting that what he did on that cross, the shedding of his blood, the breaking of his body, trusting that sacrifice, can there be any hope of salvation? Period. And when you are willing, heart willing, to repent of everything you stand for and believe and embrace what Jesus is and has done, The Bible says the Holy Spirit takes up residence. The grace of God becomes your portion. God is now in you both the will and to do according to his good pleasure. And you for the first time in your life have the opportunity to actually do something good. Eternally good. Can a man who doesn't believe any of that hold office in a country, in a nation that was founded on those core beliefs? That would be a better question than whether or not he believes that you can get to heaven through Allah just as easy as you can through Jehovah. The heaven of Jehovah is not like the heaven of Allah. Thank you very much. It's a strange world.